welcome to our second Ramadan Pioneer Series uh, and to the second batch of the, of the whole uh, Pioneer Series on Ramadan. Uh, for those of you who have seen it, I've seen some new faces. Basically, what we need to do here at the Divine Future Academy is to need that knowledge of for those who are the And today's session uh, talks about many of the things that our people have heard about. A few weeks ago, there was a whole conference about uh, here with Dubai just down the road. And some people, we, we think it's uh, the silver bullet, something that will save us all or destroy, destroy us all. And hopefully by today, we'll, we'll clear up some misconceptions uh, and uh, present some uh, realistic uh, practicalities and aspects of this technology. So that's the session. Uh, the agenda basically that we'll have is we'll have Dr. Ava give the session. Once she's done, we'll move to the business where this will be your opportunity to present your ideas. Maybe you disagree, maybe you agree, maybe you think this is all crazy. So that's the, the moment where you get to present all of that. Uh, and then uh, that will uh, say goodbye to you for the next five years. So without further ado, Dr. Ava, grab the floor. Yeah, and thank you everyone for coming and um, thank you for having me here again. I'm Eva Marie Mulashtula. I'm the chief data scientist for IBM, IBM in Middle East, Africa and Turkey. <coughs> Turkey. And I'm also the leader of the Center of Excellence for Data Science at IBM. I've worked in that field, data, AI and so on for pretty much 15 years um, on different sides of it. Um, and I also did my PhD in a topic close to using unstructured data in medical physics and machine learning algorithms. Um, I'll be talking about uncovering the myth of AI. Um, so I will be quickly explaining what is actually understood, in my opinion, by AI. Um, where do I see the trends where we're heading? Um, how will it change our life? How will it change our society? What do we expect in the future? What risk is associated with it? Um, what do we understand about global AI governance and why is it important? And <coughs> also, um, I'm probably going to cover everything you need to know about the point of singularity. Um, <coughs> as, um, as a researcher, I, I always like to start with a simple basic and saying, okay, what is it actually, what does a word mean, artificial intelligence? Um, with artificial, we basically say, um, everything made by human instead of um, being um, made naturally. Um, and intelligence, we say doing the right thing at the right time. Um, and then putting it both together, we say that are computer or computer systems um, that can actually act in an intent intelligence way and interact. Um, why is that important before I start the talk? Because um, there's a lot of um, conversations on um, what else could be AI. For example, is a book already AI? Is um, language actually a basic form of artificial intelligence because it's made by human and it helps us doing the right things? Um, is a monkey that is waving a green bag AI? I'm not covering these kind of topics. I'm saying I'm talking about computers because that's what I know. Um, for, in order to do AI, AI um, is basically a subject, um, a, a, a sub part of um, data science. That's why my title is Chief Data Scientist. And I'm not Chief AI Scientist or whatever else you can call it. Um, I cover the whole spectrum. Um, what is data? Um, data is basically everything we can measure in one way or the other. So when you look at this room, you have a um, number of people here. Um, eye color, um, height of the table, number of phones, laptops, everything else, which is obvious, but you also have a lot of other um, data that is actually produced at the moment. We have all your background information, for example. We know, um, we could know your home addresses, your educational background, um, how big is your family, what kind of houses do you live in, um, but also um, what is your heat pattern. Um, what is your behavioral pa um, 
pattern on your mobile phone, what apps have you got installed, and there's a lot of data you probably aren't aware of um, that we are actually using. Um, so when I, I, I always like, I'm, um, I love to cook and I like to compare data science to cooking. So, um, and when you look at it, you say, okay, data is basically my ingredients in cooking. It's um, the meat that I buy, the vegetables that I use, and so on. Um, data science is what do I do with it? Um, how do I get insights out of the things that I use? And it's a process of, of producing food out of my ingredients. So um, the feature engineering is one part of the first step of um, AI, and that is preparing your food, that you can actually use it. Um, then you can put it in the oven, or you can put it in the freezer, or in the microwave. That is kind of like the algorithms that we're using. And, um, and then in the end, you produce something that, um, with a purpose, um, of basically having a cake for a birthday or a dinner for your kids. Um, so a part of all of that is machine learning. Machine learning is when you cook something and you boil your spaghetti for 10 minutes and you realize, okay, no, that, that was definitely too long. Um, and next time you go for eight minutes. And this process of seeing, okay, I did something wrong, next time I do it better, when the computer does it, that's machine learning. <coughs> Then we have AI. AI has many different um, opinions, actually, on what is AI. Um, I work for IBM, and we have big arguments about what it actually is. Um, we say if it can learn, if it can interact, if it can understand, or if it can reason, then it's AI. Um, and about the beautiful thing about AI, everything is a philosophical question. Um, and I so often get un challenged on what does it actually mean, understand. Um, how can you have a definition based on understand? And um, most of the AI we see is actually what we call narrow AI. It's one task and doing one task extremely well. For example, driving a car, um, recognizing cancer, um, or just image classification, route planning, how do I, what's the fastest way from here back home? <laughs> Um, spam filtering. And then we have the topic of general AI. General AI um, is um, AI that can actually do multiple tasks. So um, it is not just playing um, chess with you, it is also driving your car, it's also deciding what you should eat, and um, it can take over very different tasks. Um, and that is something we, we're not doing, nobody is doing. All our AI at the moment is really narrow. It's on one task only. Um, the next big buzzword is um, super intelligence. Um, especially when it comes to, to, to robots um, and things like that. Everyone says, okay, but the, uh, we're heading towards a point where, where we have to deal with super intelligence. Um, super intelligent means it, it's an agent that is far more intelligent than the smartest person. And that's basically the point of um, inflection. Um, do I see a risk in that? Um, not really, because we have, we have, in narrow AI, we have narrow super intelligence, as I would call it. Um, Google Maps is better than me in finding the way. Um, AlphaGo is better than me in Go playing and better as the best person. Um, Jeopardy, we won against the best human be people 20 years ago. Um, and the computers talking to each other from Facebook, that is all in one task. So we wouldn't really classify it as general superintelligence. Um, it's machines that are good in one task and one task only. Um, where do I see the future? Um, the beautiful thing about AI is um, that is actually not what I have to deal with. I have to deal with the present. <laughs> that is actually a question for other people to, to answer. I see certain trends in the industry. Um, I see we're having more data. And we have lots of different data. So the data we are using at the moment is, um, we call it traditional data, your shopping behavior, your, your location, um, 
you're, for companies, we use P&L, we use cash flow <coughs> statements, we use um, the heat of an engine, um, all of that. But um, where we're heading is new sources. So for example, um, how often do you actually pick up your phone? And by seeing that, by reading your behavior, what time, which location you pick up the phone, that you're actually still playing Candy Crush at 3 a.m. <laughs> doesn't give you a good credit rating because if you keep on doing that, you might lose your job one day. <laughs> and we use that. Um, we use that more and more without you knowing. Um, and um, so we can use um, voice recognition actually. When you use voice recognition, voice recognition by now is gone to a point where we can reconstruct the bone structure of your face by analyzing your voice. Um, so it's actually possible more and more, that's where we're heading, to get an idea of criminals, what they look like, what, what um, race they are, um, how tall they are, how big they are, and things like that, by just listening to them on the call. Um, we um, see um, yeah, video streaming, video recognition, crowd recognition. We can track down single people. Um, and all of that is done more and more. Uh, this way. Well, actually, I have a clicker. Why don't I use it? <laughs> <laughs> Not intelligent. <laughs> With <laughs> With the, um, so by the way, if you have questions along the way, you can throw them in anytime. Um, with um, doing that, we see far more solutions spinning up and faster. Um, we have reusable code, we have standard databases, we have more and more coders, and so we have a fa lot faster turnover time. Um, and also, I don't know about your job, but my job is um, a lot of it is repetitive. So the question, will it actually kill our jobs? What, what will our job look like in the future? I hope that my spam filter will get a lot better. Um, I, um, there's a funny story about the guy who basically got himself out of a job, more or less, by having um, scripts that um, on certain things when somebody complained about something he had automatically oh I'm really sorry um, hope this happens and don't happen again and so on um, you can automize when your coffee is ready you can um, so many things that work from and we see it in corporate level from invoicing and things like that um, where we try to make all the boring jobs taking away from you um, it it goes to a drastic level. I mean, um, it's already a couple of years ago that I spoke to one of the world's largest bank and their plan was to get rid of 90% of their middle office. That's 45,000 people. Um, by using AI, by using um, process automation. Um, that is bad news for some jobs, but actually I'm, I'm a very positive person. So um, the jobs that we, or that I'm not sure that we're actually going to take full jobs away, we're going to take boring tasks away. Um, looking at the industries, um, what trends do we see in what kind of industry? So for example, at work, how many emails do I have going back and forward? When can we have a phone call? Um, I think on average, um, depending on how many people are actually in the meeting, um, schedule in the meeting can take up to 10, 20 emails and then somebody goes like, oh, by the way, I realize we have a meeting in 10 minutes, I'm actually on the plane, my plane is delayed, and the whole process starts again. This is something the computer can please take over as soon as possible. Doing my expenses, please. I mean, <laughs> my phone knows where I am, my phone knows if I'm taking an Uber for business or private. Um, so, so why do I have to put it in? Why, why doesn't it automatically go there? Um, hotels and so on, it's all linked to my credit, corporate credit card anyway. Why do I still have to copy and paste it? Um, at home we see a lot of it, shopping. Um, one thing that amazes me at my, um, my sister's place, um, diapers arrive automatically because that's something they can plan for and it's something they have to shop anymore. Washing up liquid, all of that has a certain cycle and it's just there when, when they need to. And we will see more and more of that. Um, 
uh, we have automatic communication um, coming up more. Um, if I'm late at work and I'm meeting friends and my phone knows I'm still at work, actually, but my calendar says I should be somewhere else at the other end of the city in 20 minutes, my phone can send a text message and say, <laughs> sorry, she won't make it. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> it's half an hour drive. She'll be at least 10 minutes late. Um, <laughs> and do it for me. I don't need to do that anymore. Um, light temperature optimization is something really important, especially at the workplace, because it shows a direct impact on the happiness of people, of the productivity of the people. Um, and if a lot of people are in the office, the temperature needs to be lower than if you're alone. Um, Home safety, home entertainment, we all know Netflix, we all love Netflix, so I, I don't really need to say much on that. Um, knowing if um, somebody opens the door and nobody is at home, um, your, your home should be able to know that and notify the police. Um, transportation, same. I mean, um, it is really, we have in every single area that we, um, we, we see, we see certain tasks taking away. I don't see any general AI in that, to be honest. I don't think, and it makes no sense at all, that my cancer recognition machine should call the police because somebody comes into my house. It's a completely different task. <laughs> um, <clears throat> same on the security side. Um, crowd management, um, large football events, what doors to close at what time, um, or um, yeah, rock concert events. Um, finding single people in a big crowd, finding criminals um, all over the world, just by seeing them appearing somewhere on the camera. <coughs> Crime prediction, uh, making sure that the police is at the right place. Um, we have it already at emergencies. Um, I did a large project and I can talk about it in the UK. Um, how many emergency first responders do we need at what place for what kind of event? Um, it makes a difference if you have a heavy metal concert than if you have um, Britney Spears playing. Yeah. Question. If you have good data, do you see this being, these solutions being provided by the big companies, the HPs, the Googles of the world? Or do you think even small companies have a chance if they have the same good data? I, I think definitely small companies have a chance. A lot of these actually, um, a lot of the um, image recognition and so on um, is, um, is c comes from startups and um, then either gets taken over by large, um, by the tech giants um, or um, we are actually competing against a lot of the startups as well. Um, <coughs> because um, you have, um, for, for narrow AI, it depends on, um, on, on the client. Um, it's one thing at IBM that really hurts us, we have no customer data. So Google, Facebook and so on, they know everything about you. So they can target their solutions to you. We know nothing about people, we have no data. Um, so when we go to the ministries, when we go to the governments, we, we rely on their data. And, and that is the same what startups have. So it really depends on, on how do you, um, how, how good is your customer's data? How good are, are your people in actually getting the insights out of the data? Yes? You, you talked about the new sources of data providing new solutions. Hmm? But if now privacy has become more of an issue than before. Yeah. Like with Google and Facebook and what happened with Congress. So how are we going to get um, so, um, as, a, as a person, me, getting someone else's data, it shouldn't. Um, me being German, um, uh, we have a very, I mean, um, we, we one of the driving countries behind GDPR. Um, we have a, a strong mistrust against our government and against other organizations. And we have a strong need of privacy. So um, we are really against saying sharing data. Um, England has a slightly different approach. England, for example, has the Open Data Institute. Um, and in, in England, they, they think that um, publishing data is actually good against corruption. Corruption is not an issue in Germany. Privacy is the issue. So um, what happens in, 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 in England, they, have, they publish health data and so on. I don't believe in anonymized data. If I get someone's, um, and I, when I was in, in data scientist in the UK, it was before GDPR, 
it was heaven. We, we bought Vodafone signals. We knew exactly who's doing what. We got health data. We got um, an the anonymized health data. But you an anonymized <laughs> health data, you combine that with a Vodafone signal, you combine that with Transport for London. And then uh, you know exactly where your neighbor is going. <laughs> if your neighbor is going out of the country next weekend, and you know he's in France, and you know where he lives, you, and you know where he works, you can target him. You know this anonymized number is your neighbor. And, and if then, he, if he does something that when, he, when his wife goes like, oh yeah, my husband is there, and you go like, mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I wish I would be more of a criminal, I would be really rich. <laughs> be like, how much do you pay me for not telling your wife? <laughs> Um, data changes. So um, data changes, and so at the beginning, you 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 need to really look at the quality of the data. You need to have um, a strong. It's it's similar to cooking. You need good ingredients. Otherwise, you don't need to start cooking. And um, and so you, we we assess the data quality. We say how much information is actually in there. Um, for example, um, property valuation. Um, a lot of people want to um, forecast the sales price of a property and say that's a good use case for data science. But then they supply you with 20 different signals and that is not enough because as a human being when you go into a property you go like, where's the sun? What, is, what floor is there? And um, having worked in property res um, restructuring, the best way of changing the value of your property is painting the hallway and spraying around chlorine. You get 20% more for your um, property because people, the hallway, people think it's a good house. You can talk about, um, tell amazing stories about the neighbors and say it's a really decent house. Nobody is checking on the neighbor, but it looks nice. So um, with, with th signals like that who are massive drivers uh, but are not picked up for the use case, it's, um, it's a big trade-off. You really need to understand the use case and you need to understand what you're doing and what you're looking for. You then um, see how good is your prediction and how much, so um, the, uh, when, you, when you train the data or when you prepare the data, you have to make sure you don't lose the information in the data. Um, and, um, and it's similar to, to, again, when you cook, when you, when you put everything into to the mixer in the end, it, you don't like the food either. Um, so you have to be careful how you handle the data and then you can actually, there are a lot of things where you can say actually the data is not good enough to, to answer the question that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. That um, is again a difficult question. Um, a lot of people think the person, that people own their own data. Um, Ideally, I think people should own their own data, yes. Um, but then there's also the question of uh, the greater good. For example, my healthcare data. If, it is, if my healthcare data can be used to save other people's life, shouldn't there be an obligation to share it? Um, shouldn't there be, um, play or, um, especially when it comes into the security section, um, we, you own your car, but if you're a criminal, they can still take it away. <laughs> so um, I, I'd say for corporates, um, and, and that's where GDPR and our um, data guidelines are going to, you have to be willing to share it. Um, in terms of companies, for example, you mentioned Google, Facebook, etc., mm -hmm. owning the data or having access to large data, so mm -hmm. and they would monetize it for them basically for their own benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned startups, for example, mm -hmm. who uh, potentially do the same thing. Um, there's there's always a question about security, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, how would you see it moving forward to monetize it? Since you mentioned that people can own their own data, mm -hmm. how would how would it be possible to monetize it for the people instead of just basically startups or big companies? So so in Google, you get a trade-off. You get you get um, Google for free. 
um, you get um, Facebook you can use for free. Um, they're, they're running this massive company and you have their services for free. What people don't realize, they're actually paying with their personal information. And, um, and I think that is, um, and I'll talk about it later as well, um, there is no, no free lunch. Um, if you share your data, um, you, you're giving it for someone. And it's, for example, one thing that always, and I'll, yeah, I'll touch in a bit. Um, but one thing that um, surprises me when, especially in the UAE, when I go to a coffee shop and they ask me to log into um, their Wi-Fi, they offer me to log in with my Facebook account. And then they have access to my Facebook. I'm like, hold on, I'm not giving you some, I mean, do you realize how much I'm paying for using your app, <laughs> using your internet? That's ridiculous. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm always surprised because you also get the option of signing in with your email address. And, and I have a, a, a new email every month that I use for that and then I close it down and I start a new one. So, so I actually do get my internet for free. <laughs> the question basically, a lot of sorry, sorry to interrupt. Hmm? Yeah. Of your interactive, yeah. Okay. Yeah. After the, the presentation, so now we'd like to be focusing more on the presentation, and okay. we're gonna have a short <laughs> conversation. Let's you know, stretch out. <laughs> and so, so where do I see the workforce? Um, I think um, one of the um, we. One of the things that will happen is we, we take away the boring stuff, the repetitive stuff. That's what's happening first. Um, and um, one thing we're extremely good in is being creative. One thing that's absolutely amazing about it, no matter who you talk to, every human being has amazing creative ideas. And some of you might argue and say, okay, actually computers can be creative too. Um, Universal Pictures has a massive amount of AI running in the background. But what they're actually doing is they're, again, they're narrow creative. Um, when we see um, creativity in art, it's we take these colors and these colors and we combine it together and then we get a, something that looks like Picasso, something that looks like Monet. But it's not really creative. Um, I, I, I like to com um, compared with this amazing invention, who's German? <laughs> it's it's very it's it's a very narr a narrow invention. It's putting ice cream and spaghetti together, and <laughs> basically squeeze ice cream through your spaghetti machine, and <laughs> it looks like spaghetti tastes like ice cream. I love it. <laughs> I'll be in Germany next week, and I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> but but that is that is the level of invention that our computers are at. Um, they are combining in the past in their narrow subject two things together and, and and going forward. But when we look at the great invention we have in our society, is when we actually take two completely unrelated concepts. When we look at um, carriages and and oil engines, and then we say, oh, when we put these two things together, we can have cars. That's where we actually make big jumps. When we look at water and wind, and we say, why don't we build sailing boats? And, 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 and that's where we are really good at. And that's where we are using our general <laughs> intelligence. Um, and that's where computers will not be able to pick up. Um, we touched on it earlier, um, the, the risk of AI. <laughs> um, People think this is the risk of AI. Who of you thinks that's the risk of AI? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I think we are far, far away from that. We, we don't. <laughs> um, that is definitely not a risk of AI. That is a risk of AI. Why? What do you see? Thinking about our jobs. You, know, you see bias there. <laughs> Uh, women in the top for nursing and men for the mechanic. Exactly spot on. That's what I'm looking for. So you, and you Google and you Google nurse, you only see women. Why not men? Nurse is, is there's not a gender to nurse. It can be, it should be 50-50. There's, there's two, two guys for diversity reasons. And there's also here a female car mechanic. <laughs> and um, and we, we, that's a bias. 
there's a bias in our AI solution. And when people start using it, when, when, when girls want to become car mechanics, and they only see men, it will put them off. It will enforce that. Um, and it will get stronger and stronger because you can spread it out easily. Um, I like to tell a little story here um, about um, AI Week last year. And um, I, I went there with my colleagues and we were standing there for a moment and there was this big robot um, and so around it by me was press and colleagues and this robot came down to my side and I was like, oh, that's nice. And it was like getting smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> until he was eye level. <laughs> and then he looked at me like, ooh, you're really foxy. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it started blinking hearts and I was like, what is going on here? And, and he was becoming extremely friendly he <laughs> and charming and I was like this is really odd and um, I, I tried to get away from that and I was like okay um, tell me a joke and it didn't react I was like please tell me a joke again it didn't react and then my colleague um, in his massive Greek accent said tell me a joke and it immediately told a joke about sexual harassment <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and when I actually, I, I was absolutely shocked by that and because all of this is so wrong and so I turned to the um, woman presenting the robot and I was like, I'm, I'm really sorry but you do realize there's something not okay here and she's like, yeah, he really loves women. I was like, <laughs> okay, he? Um, and then, oh, you should be flattered. I was like, I'm sorry, but there's more to a man than just code in a plastic box. I'm sorry, but um, I don't think we should call that he. I don't think anything, any robot we build, we should call he or she. He or she is not human made. And um, it's, um, they were talking about how wonderful it is to roll this out to, to kids and schools. I mean, they can ask questions their teacher that they wouldn't dare to ask a teacher and I was like yeah and they get answers <laughs> the teacher would never dare to say <laughs> um, and um, and I think um, this whole situation of the robot not reacting to female voices because it was trained by by, by men the the robot actually thinking that is a good way to to um, interact with women um, and by, by developing AI, we can mass produce that. We can roll that out around the world and it gets, at the moment we have no auditing body or nothing. We can have it in every single school because the person who bought it might have been male and not recognized it. So um, my, my problem with the risk is um, we don't see it. It's extremely complex. Um, there are so many different level of risk involved in it. We, um, I've um, built, um, for example, predictive loan machines um, five years ago, where um, we had lots of different inputs, for example, postcodes. And suddenly you don't get a, a loan anymore, your credit card rating goes down because you live in a wrong postcode. Um, we can, um, th the input data you use, and especially when you come up to 10,000 different um, signals, um, back at KPMG we said we never use religion as an input date, um, factor because we had um, um, co um, other companies, startups being get on companies losing massively on market share because um, the AI or the targeted marketing they um, build was looking for things like skin color, religion and so on. But what we didn't realize um, six, seven years ago is actually do you work on Friday or do you work on Sunday? Is actually as toxic as putting in religion. What do you eat is as dangerous as religion. And, and these are things you only pick up with experience. And, and there isn't that much experience in the market. The decision makers often think, okay, even when I, when I see my clients, often they come from technology backgrounds. But just because you know computer software and you know, know the technology, doesn't mean you can actually understand the risk of the solution that you're building. Um, the, the, the picture before was uh, um, about the bias. 
um, and we have um, racial gender and so on. We can be sampled in the wrong way. We have a lot of, um, especially these startups in San Francisco are wonderful in um, sampling on people around them. So um, they think because 25 to 35 year old people are buying it, they're going to be absolutely rock stars around the world. No, not everyone lives in San Francisco and not everyone is um, a startup um, 25 year old male. Um, we also over trust the solution. We rely on it, we don't question it. And um, what often is happening is we build something and it's 95% accurate. That means it's wrong five times at least out of 100 people. Yeah, but we still take it as 100%, for sure. Um, we, we misinterpret the results because we're only looking at one area. We generally misuse it for the wrong, we build something for the wrong purpose. Um, and so I can go on, the list is, is extremely long, but um, there is a lot of risk to it. Um, the problem that we have um, is actually a society problem. Is, um, we call it the pacing problem. The technology we are developing at the moment is um, advancing at an exponential speed. We are, we are so shooting ahead in our research labs. Um, but our society, our economic, um, political and legal change is very slow, it's only incremental. And um, when, I, when I speak to my friends in the legal um, um, area, professions, they really struggle with, we struggle to talk to each other. And um, I get questions like, so this big data, how does it work? Can I, can I just, is it like electricity? Can I just plug in my, my internet cable into the wall and then I get the data? And you're sitting there like, y yes, in a way, but no, um, I don't. <laughs> um, it's, it's a completely different mindset. And um, we, we have to make sure we, we, we don't get lost in that gap. Um, we also have um, what I, um, what's, um, it's an old concept actually, it's many, many years old, decades old, it's called the Colin, um, Colin Rich Dilemma. Um, that basically means when we develop something, we cannot foresee the impact it has. We cannot foresee the change it has to our society. Once we see it, it's too late to change it. And um, so, for example, um, when um, the internet was, um, or computers, when, when we first had the computers on the market, oh my God, nobody would ever buy a personal computer. That was a common, common not, uh, opinion about that. Um, now nobody can leave the house without having their phone in their pocket. Internet, um, nobody thought we will really use it that much. I mean, um, I was in boarding school at that time and like pinging someone and saying, hey, what are you doing? Was, was kind of like cool because they were at the other end of the world. Um, but actually picking up the phone and having a conversation was, was a much better use of your time. We didn't, nobody saw it coming. Um, and same with data science. Nobody saw it coming uh, the way it came. Um, when um, um, also like two or three years ago, I was asked by somebody, so if you look back five years from, from then, so eight years from now, and you would uh, look at you today, so three years from now, what would you eight years ago self would think about where you are at the moment? And I just looked <laughs> at that person, um, I was like, you know which industry I work in. <laughs> it's like, one, well, like, I work in data science and AI. Anyone who would have told you eight years ago that they saw this coming is a liar. <laughs> Nobody saw it coming as big as it did. Um, I, um, when, we are, um, when we are building retail solutions, and retail was actually um, one of the first who, who picked up on data science. Um, which is funny because other industries, for example, banking and um, especially banking and insurance, they had all the mathematicians. They didn't pick up on data science at all. They're slowly picking up on it. Mm -hmm. But um, a retailer who had no mathematicians 
they were one of the early adopters. But still you had conversations, a good friend of mine who was um, CEO of um, uh, Vimeo, it's I think similar to um, YouTube or something. Um, he looked at me like, yeah, but you know this data science, I mean, it's nice that you work in that field, but come on, it's, it's n it doesn't really make any difference. Um, <laughs> yeah, he sh I'm glad he wasn't CEO of Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, have, we have this problem. And for example, when we look at um, things like Instagram or Tinder, um, it really changes our society. Suddenly, food has to look in a way that we can put it on Instagram. Um, I remember when I was a child and we were on holiday, my parents said, could you go away? I want to take a picture. And it was always clear, we don't want our kids on the pictures. Now everyone's like, this is me? Oh, forget about my holiday, but this is me. <laughs> and, and we're really changing us. Um, and the question is, do we want that? And we cannot answer these questions until it's too late to actually turn it down. <coughs> it has um, everything we do in AI um, has a massive impact on 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 four major levels. Um, it has an impact on the individual, and and it comes back to privacy. How much do I share? Um, how do I make sure my privacy is protected? Um, in in retail, we can actually we know so much about people that it's scary. Um, we can tell you when you feel like buying chocolate. And that is not good. That is, that is not a nice, <laughs> it's, it, it scares people when they, when they wake up in the morning and, and your phone goes like, what about chocolate? And you're like, no, we, no, that is not right. <laughs> um, we, can, we, can, um, we have to make sure you're safe and secure. Um, not just for, um, for, um, for others, but also for outside threats. Um, you as a personal individual have to make sure that your data is safe and sure. Um, and it can impact you on your equal rights and fairness. Um, make sure that um, you still get the loans, you still get the credit rating, you still um, are not targeted by the police for um, certain things. Um, oh. And um, also on the society, sorry, this way, uh, organizations. We have um, organizations are very worried about, for example, the intellectual property um, protection on developing code. Um, what does it mean for economic disruption? Do we have companies like Uber coming up? Um, it, will, it will change the competition, it will change the market. And the risk is that they over rely on it. Um, society overall, we have um, biases, we have confirmation, uh, um, behavioral um, conforma uh, conformity, basically that every time you leave the house you have to look Instagram ready. Um, we have to have a lifestyle that is, looks cool on Instagram, we have to present us positive. Um, and. Um, a massive impact is with all this data being available, being open, we have a security risk. It sounds a bit like I'm against innovation. I am not. I, I love my job. <laughs> um, but there are two principles to approach it. And one of them is what we call the precautionary principle. Um, it's basically saying, okay, innovation is not okay until we make sure it's okay. Um, we call that the bottom-up approach. It's basically saying, before you do something, make sure it's safe. Um, you can only develop code that causes no harm to individual and groups and so on. Um, that isn't in violation with your uh, laws and you have to or our traditions. And you have to ensure that first. Um, the other thing that is the permissive innovation. Basically, say, do whatever you want. Um, it's, everything is allowed until we have a case against it. And, um, and it's a constant trade-off. When we see our um, solutions, um, and we basically we have um, five um, points where we, t where we check in, saying, is it um, highly probable, the impact? Is it tangible? Is it immediate? Is it irreversible? And is it, or could it be catastrophic, what we're developing? Um, then we go precautions. Otherwise, we can be a little bit more lax, relaxed. 
Um, that is our, pr um, as a practitioner, um, as an individual, that's how we act. But actually what we need and what we still don't have is a legal framework. Um, and um, I worked together with it on um, with various um, bodies. I was advisor for the House of Lords. They were just here for um, AI everything. Um, and um, so it's nice to have them coming to me. <laughs> okay, they didn't come for me. But <laughs> um, and um, I'm also working with the United Nations on that, um, on saying we need to have a legal framework that ensures that the machine learning technologies that we develop are well researched and well developed and um, that they have the goal of helping humanity um, to um, um, navigate us through fair systems. Um, and, and that is something really important. Um, and that is something where I'm, I'm um, spending, it's basically I'm spending a lot of my spare time on, on pushing that forward and saying, make sure we need that. We need a global AI governance. Global because AI sees no borders. You can easily attack cross borders. You can um, send your apps across borders and so on. So that's why we have to work together. The problem that we have at the moment is we still don't have a clear definition on what is AI and what is not. We don't even know what a robot actually is. We think that when I say robot, people think of Terminator. Um, but, but, but where does a robot start? Um, and, and that's why it's such a difficult question to, to answer. We, we, at the moment, we are, we are starting on a low level and we're starting with saying, okay, what is actually data? We have data frameworks, we have GDPR, and we have um, um, data guidelines around the world, but they're not going far enough. Um, we also have guiding principles for developing AIs. They're not enforced in any way, they're, not, they're only there as an as a principle for people to orientate on and say, make sure your AI is explainable, transparent and fair, and every AI system should put the human first. We should be human-centric. Um, it's also everyone's responsibility on what we're doing. Um, we need to start earlier. We need to start in schools. Um, we need to start educating um, our children um, that their data is something of value, that it's nothing to be shared. Um, and I rem one of the phrases that drives me crazy is, I've got nothing to hide. Please, everyone has something to hide. We don't walk around naked. We, we, we don't expose everything. Um, so, so hide it. Hide your medical records. It's not, a, it, it's not your neighbor's business. It's not your enemy's business. Um, be aware that there is value in that um, for somebody. Um, that is um, that you personally be engaged, that we as a personal, as coders, we have to be personally engaged, we have to be sure what we're doing is ethical. Um, organizations have to be involved, they have to have a risk management in place to make sure that what they are producing, what they're adopting, what they're buying, um, what they're selling is actually human-centric, is actually fair, is unbiased. They need to have a process in um, place. They also need to educate their employers. And in my opinion, and that is where we're really lacking, is they need to be audited. Same like financial institutions. We need the le um, national le um, laws and regulations. <coughs> we need the supervising bodies. We need um, certification and saying, OK, this has been tested. It's fine. It's fine for kids to use. And we also need more active social responsibility groups. Um, that is, um, I think that is pretty much the end of my talk. I promise to talk about the point of singularity and everything you need to know. <laughs> Let's talk about singularity when we actually solve what's important. <laughs> because for me, the point of singularity is miles away. We have a lot of pressure really important job um, to do first. We have to make sure we're safe. Um, but once we have AI in place, and once we have all the spare time to be creative, because we don't spend it on repetitive tasks anymore, then we can talk about singularity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
I have a, I have a quote that is actually quite um, funny. It's from 1986, and I have it on. Um, actually, when I wrote my um, um, doctor thesis, I wrote about um, ultrasound.